So a partnership with ISRO, I'll show you a slide that has our initial take on that. But these missions are really big endeavors, especially when it comes to a huge physical space that has a physical object that has to be launched into space. So NASA has a major role to play, ISRO had a major role to play, industry has a major role to play, and not, not least, our state departments also had a major role to play in making not just the agreement come in the first place, but in allowing people to go easily back and forth between the US and India to make this thing happen. So it's really quite amazing what, what it takes to put these missions together. So just as a, as a note, I was hoping Nilesh would be here, so I guess he had to go, but those of you from SAC, you can point this out to him. This was a, um, a memo, this was the agenda from our very first meeting when I came in December of 2011, uh, just showing you what we were proposing to do. And if I blow this up, you can see the first, the fourth line down is science proposal from NASA. This was our first introduction of the NISAR concept to ISRO. And I have to say, everybody was extremely excited about the possibility of, of partnering on this topic. Three years later, it took three years for us to get an international agreement so we could actually begin the development of the mission. So this was in 2014. You may not recognize that person on the top left. That's me, <laughs> without my beard. Uh, there you can see Nilesh Desai, Tapan Misra, who was instrumental in all of this, and all of the players you can see in this picture, many of them are in the room here very important people in making this mission a reality. So I mentioned that it's a, it's a strong collaboration between industry and, uh, and uh, space agencies. This just shows you the details of how the system is divided in terms of who contributed what. Uh, ISRO has provided the spacecraft bus and the launch vehicle, mission systems capabilities. NASA's provided the big reflector and the uh, boom, as well as that octagonal structure with all the radar electronics on it. And of course, ISRO provided the S-band electronics that's in that octagonal structure. So it's a very big system. And you can see also there's an engineering payload NASA provided with GPS and a very large solid state recorder. Uh, that helps get all of this data to the ground. A major complicated partnership. One of the key things about this mission is the data acquisition strategy. We, as I said earlier, we plan to take data over all land and ice covered surfaces of the Earth every time we are over them for the life of the mission. So we've got as you can see here, a number of different modes. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of the modes, but these modes in a given geographic region are used repeatedly every cycle. So we're not changing modes at any given geographic area. We are just changing them with the geographic area. And that then allows us to create consistent time series in a particular mode geared to the science disciplines that have requested those modes. So you can see very comprehensive coverage. This is just showing you the ascending tracks. We also observe the same kind of coverage on the descending tracks. That was for L-band. L-band has global coverage for reasons that are a little technical. S-band, uh, is mostly focused over India and the surrounding regions, Antarctica, and a number of CalVal sites around the world. Um, and you can see that there's quite a bit of ocean data here. This is the ascending tracks for L and S-band coverage, and these are the descending tracks for L and S-band coverage. So you can see quite comprehensive coverage. This is still an enormous amount of data. And this is a completely unique data set of L and S-band multipolarimetric interferometric data 
that will be acquired regularly every 12 days over all of these areas. This will be the envy of the world, and it will be a natural test bed for all kinds of algorithm development, all of your machine learning algorithms that you can apply to this. It's going to be quite fantastic. To make that happen, uh, we have to have a very complex and uh, capable ground system. We have very high rate transmitting uh, telemetry systems on board, four gigabits per second, and those, uh, we have two actually, one provided by ISRO and one provided by NASA, and they send data to different ground stations. We have ISRO ground stations and we have NASA ground stations. The NASA data is gonna go, the L-band data is gonna go to the NASA ground stations in the current plan, be processed on the cloud and sent to the science community quickly. The S-band data and some selected L-band data will go to the ISRO ground stations, go to their processing facility at NRSC and then be distributed to the community. We also have a capability for telling the satellite that we need to urgently observe in a particular location, so an urgent response capability. So there's an interaction with the science team and the mission planners for getting uh, acquisition requests quickly to the spacecraft. This is a lot of global coordination that has to happen seamlessly without loss of a bit of data over the life of the mission, yet to be exercised. Looking forward to it, though. So I'm going to show you now a few slides related to our status and the development. They should go very quickly. So it is a big uh, endeavor to try to put all this together. We started the integration back in 2019 or so uh, with the um, L-band system. The S-band system did its own integration and test. Eventually they came together <clears throat> and were married together into one system at JPL. Many ISRO colleagues stayed at JPL for months at a time to put those things together. Those then got fully integrated and went into this radar payload INT in the 21 to 20, 23 time frame. Then we shipped that whole system to ISRO uh, in March 2023 and the whole observatory including the spacecraft was then integrated to make uh, the full spacecraft. We were supposed to then launch a few months later in like April of 2024, but unfortunately we ran into a little problem with the testing and we ended up having to slip for another year. So the launch has not happened yet, but we expect it to happen soon. So just a few more pictures. You can see the uh, L-band system uh, in the um, thermal vac chamber, the one on the left, shows the actual flight electronics with a mass mock-up of the rest of the system. Uh, that was in 2020. The full system, after fully integrating it, was then tested in 2022. So you can see it's a lot of hardware that we're putting together there. Then it got packed up and sent to ISRO put onto a C-17 uh, Air Force plane that's the only one big enough to hold that kind of large structure. You can see it just fitting in the cargo bay there with about one inch to spare. And then it arrived in ISRO and was shipped to the EyeSight facility. So then after it got to EyeSight, it was fully integrated. That drawing on the left was a CAD drawing from, I don't know, 2014, the original concept of what we were going to do. If you look at the actual built flight system in January 2024, it looks really similar. We have not changed the design much in the 10 years of development that we have. So as I mentioned, we had a little problem with the reflector uh, thermal conditions. So you can see on the left, it was black. On the right, after nine months of conditioning, it is now sort of shiny silver. They had to put some reflective tape to keep it cooler under certain conditions. And so that's the final system. Here's a few more examples of that in its final checks at the EyeSight facility at ISRO. This is now finished, final testing, and it's being put into storage until a launch vehicle is available for us. 
So I'm just going to say a few more words here. I just want to emphasize that by having L and S-band uh, on both, both at the same time on the same system, we have a capability that is quite unique here. This is the closest thing we have to a dual frequency spaceborne system. Uh, and this was taken by the Circe XR system back in 1994. So this is L band and C band. The C band is well, close to S band, not quite the same. But you can see on the left side is um, wheat fields. The right side is uh, rubber plantations, that kind of thing. The signatures, these are multi polarization and multi-frequency combinations of color here to illustrate what you're seeing. These different surface types have very different signatures and you would see much less discrimination if you only had one frequency. So these two frequencies are going to be really key for understanding what's going on. Another part of this collaboration was to bring an LNS band system that ISRO produced uh, some of the people in this room produced it, uh, bring it to the United States and fly it on our UAV SAR system. So you can see we have this G3 aircraft with a radar pod that is mounted on the bottom side. The um, antenna for the LNS band system, you can see one of the ISRO engineers working on it, was mounted in that pod. The electronics were up in the actual fuselage uh, area. And uh, the, we flew over 150 uh, flights in the United States over many different kinds of science targets to be able to understand the characteristics of L and S-band data. So this kind of partnership uh, opens up all kinds of possibilities. The L and S-band system operate by the SweepSAR technique whereby we can, we basically have 24 L-band radars and 48 S-band radars, if you think about it, because each one of those orange boxes is a transmit-receive module. We can transmit on them individually and receive on them individually, and then electronically or digitally, we, look, we can combine those signals together. That's a simplified way of saying it, but it allows us then to get this full sweep of the full swath in real time, track the signals as they come back in the multiple beams, add them together, reduce the data rates to a manageable level, but still get high resolution and full swap. 